now is we're going to take a look at some of the different types of epithelium. And then, like I said, what I will switch over to after that is taking a look at these different types of epithelium on some of the digital slides. So again, we went through the basic naming system, the simple versus stratified, the squamous, cuboidal, and uh, columnar epitheliums. So what we're going to do now is go through the, all the eight different subtypes of these to take a look at some pictures of what they look like and do some of the basics of what they're good at where you might find them. So simple squamous epithelium is a single layer of very thin cells. As I was kind of saying before, thickest area on these ones tends to be the nucleus. So a lot of times they look like uh, sunny side up eggs. Uh, so like a fried egg where the bulge would be the yolk, that's the nucleus. So you can see the arrow right here pointing at a couple nuclei of that. Uh, generally can't see any cytoplasm in there and are generally lining some type of opening. So this would be actually in a, uh, it's a capsule surrounding uh, the glomerulus. It's part of the filtration unit in the kidney. And if you were to think about what might these be good at, I mean, again, if you're thinking like of our different options there, absorption, secretion, protection, diffusion and osmosis, sensory, on these ones, protection, really not a good protective thing here. You got a single layer that's super thin, but diffusion, the thinner, the layer, osmosis, these are the things that would allow that filtration to happen rather easily. And again, that's what this one's most likely doing. And not surprisingly, we're going to see this in areas where you should have quick diffusion, quick osmosis, other things happening. So that's part of the reason we see it in these areas. So things like air sacs of the alveoli of the lungs, you have a simple squamous cell connected to a capillary, which is another simple squamous cell, which allows that oxygen and carbon dioxide to move very quickly from the lungs to the blood and vice versa. Uh, we see it in the glomerular capsule in the kidney. That was a picture I just showed you before. Uh, it lines all blood vessels as the endothelium and capillaries. It's the only layer. Uh, this does make up some membranes called serous membranes where it does do a little bit of secretion. A lot of times we see this as an epithelial lining of a lot of different organs and a lot of times we call that mesothelium there, uh, endothelium inside blood vessels. Again, that's one of the things you'll notice with anatomy and physiology. A lot of times if a cell is in a different spot or with histology as well, a cell in a different type of tissue, some of the roots will stay the same, but the name will change a little bit. Uh, so again, simple squamous epithelium here. You can see a single layer here, uh, very thin. This is mainly involved in exchange, diffusion, osmosis, filtration, a little bit of absorption and secretion, but again, the main thing here, it's letting things move in or out of blood vessels, moving in or out of the alveoli of the lungs. It's again, one of those layers that is acting as a membrane for stuff to travel through without larger things being allowed to go through it. Simple cuboidal epithelium, again, single layer, cube-shaped cells, height and width about the same size, generally a circular nucleus in the center. Uh, sometimes you might see microvilli uh, in kidney tubules. You would definitely see microvilli. Obviously, if you see microvilli, you knew this is doing really a lot of absorption. We also see this in a lot of glandular epithelium as well in terms of doing some of that secretion. So this is one we see definitely having a lot more absorption and secretion taking place. Uh, places we see this, a lot of our glandular organs, so the liver and the pancreas, we see it there salivary glands, thyroid gland, uh, these things that are making a lot of substance for secretion. Uh, sometimes you see it in areas where we're doing absorption, like the kidney tubules, you, in certain areas there, you'll see them with microvilli on there. And the lungs, not surprisingly hidden there, the lungs you'll see kind of have a, uh, a smorgasbord of them. Uh, honestly, the lungs, if you want to look at the different parts of the lungs, you will see most of the epithelial types somewhere in that tubule system that makes up the lungs. So the lungs are kind of changing throughout. It's kind of interesting in that sense. But these bronchioles, you will see some of those there. Again, what are these doing? Mainly absorption and secretion. And then we see that a lot in most of our types of epithelium are gonna be some absorption and secretion. So areas where we see absorption happening a lot are the kidney tubules. A lot of times you'll see microvilli on those ones. Uh, we'll come back to that later on when we do urinary system towards the end. You'll actually differentiate some of the different tubule types based on what they look like. Uh, the liver, those hepatocytes are cuboidal cells lining the blood vessels in there. We also see a lot of secretion taking place in certain areas. Again, kidney tubules, different 
tubule type, but the liver, the pancreas, those different salivary glands, thyroid glands, and certain other glands, you're going to see a lot of these simple cuboidal epithelial cells. And again, doing a lot of absorption and secretion is the nice little summary here. Again, sometimes they might be a little bit more rounded off, more, more pyramid shaped, but the main thing is height and width are similar, rounded, centralized nucleus. See this in a lot of different glands. The last of the simple epithelial, basic epithelial subtypes is simple columnar. Uh, tall, narrow cells generally have a oval or sausage shaped nuclei, tends to be towards the bottom half of the cell. Again, these ones may have microvilli present, obviously where there's microvilli present doing a lot of absorption. Uh, sometimes has vesicles that we'll see. Uh, there is something called a goblet cell, which is a specialized lubricating uh, mucus producing cell that we see in the digestive tract as well as in the lungs. It is a simple columnar epithelial cell with a large secreting area. Uh, certain areas we also see these containing cilia. Uh, these are going to allow stuff to move past the cell. Uh, simple common epithelium, like I said, a lot of absorption and secretion area. So digestive tract, with the exception of the esophagus and the oral cavity, tends to be lined almost entirely with simple common epithelium. So the lining of the stomach, the small and large intestines, as well as the rectum, all simple common epithelium. Uh, none of these have cilia. They will have microvilli in a lot of those areas. Gallbladder, you see it in there as well. The uterine tubes, we see the ciliated version of simple columnar epithelium. I don't tend to point that one out other than when we're in the fallopian tubes in the, uh, the reproductive systems. I try not to show that one as much because I don't want you to get it confused with pseudostratified. Uh, again, sometimes these can look multi-layered. This is a perfect side view of it where you can see those sausage-shaped nuclei. Sometimes if you don't get it quite perfect or it's an angle, you'll see multiple cells worth of nuclei. Sometimes that can be a little confusing. I'll try to show you the areas that are the best examples of this type of epithelium though. But that is simple columnar epithelium. And again, the places we see it. What is it doing? A lot of absorption and secretion in those areas where there is microvilli doing a lot of absorption, secretion in a lot of other areas, especially where we see those goblet cells. Uh, outside of that, movement in those areas where there is a presence of cilia. So again, elongated cells, elongated nuclei, height greater than the width, doing a lot of absorption in certain areas, a lot of secretion in others. Uh, in places we see it, colon, stomach, large and small intestine, gallbladder, are all places we see this. Fallopian tubes with the cilia. So stratified epithelium, again, two or more layers thick based on the apical surface cell. So the one on the left here would be which type? It would be stratified squamous. And again, a lot of these are going to be a little bit more protective in certain areas. Uh, again, stratified squamous is probably the most common stratified type of epithelium. Uh, and we'll see that in a lot of areas of the body. So stratified squamous, again, there is two main types to this. There is a keratinized version and a non-keratinized version. Uh, a lot of times we refer to the keratinized version of stratified squamous as dry epithelium. It's what you see on the surface of the skin. Everything you see skin that is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium fills up with a protein called keratin, waterproof, tough, bacteria static, stuff can't get through it particularly easy. It is this upper layer all up here. But again, you can see these cells are flattened out at the surface stratified squamous epithelium. The non-keratinized version would be the mucous membrane, so oral cavity, for example, is that non-keratinized version. It does not have those dead surface layers filled with keratin. So the keratinized version, the skin more prominent on the palms and the soles are very, very keratinized. Non-keratinized versions, pretty much areas that are inside if you want to say inside the body, but open to the outside. So oral cavity, inside of the mouth, the esophagus. We don't want uh, simple epithelium there in that sometimes you don't chew your food well. It's abrasive. And then other areas that are open to the outside of the body, things that could have mechanical abrasion as well, lining of the vagina, lining of the anal canal, are both with the stratified squamous epithelium, non-keratinized. And the main thing with this one, it's protection all around. 
Uh, multiple layers, the keratinized version, very bacteria proof, waterproof, very protective in that sense against abrasion. The non keratinized version, uh, things that are open the outside that you might not chew food well enough, sex, uh, childbirth, a defecation, all these things that you want, not something to get ripped open. So we have multiple layers where even if it's a little bit damaged on the surface, it's not going to penetrate all the way through these tens of layers or more. Stratified cuboidal, we don't see this in a ton of places. It's mainly sweat, blood, sweat glands in certain areas and ovarian follicles are the two main areas. Main thing on this one, you can see the bottom layer looks a little bit flatter, but the apical surface is cuboidal. That is stratified cuboidal. This is a sweat duct right there. So certain sweat glands in the epithelium, in the, excuse me, in the dermis of the skin, you can see some of these sweat glands. Uh, the other place we see this is the ovarian follicle. So this is a picture of an ovarian follicle. You can see the egg cell right here in blue. All these cells from this basement membrane to here are stratified cuboidal. So what are these doing? Obviously sweat glands are secreting sweat. Uh, the gland, uh, the ovarian follicle is secreting sex hormones of the female, estrogen and progesterone. Uh, so both of them, both those cases secretion. The last of the basic kind of classifications here is stratified commoner epithelium. Again, you can see on this one, look maybe a little bit more cube shaped at the bottom, but on the surface here, more columnar shaped. This is one I'm not gonna actually have you identify. These are very rare. Uh, you see it in certain areas of certain places. So like in the anal canal, in the male urethra, on the epiglottis, it's a lot of times where you get different types of epithelium kind of connecting to one another. But this is the one where I can't go and find a slide in the lab or a digital slide even and for sure know I'm gonna find it there and be able to show it to you. I do want you to know it exists, know what's going on with it, but this is not one I'm gonna show you a picture of and ask you to identify. But again, we see this a lot of times where different subtypes are connecting to one another. It helps maintain that structural integrity of the gland. So the other thing we'll see is there is a couple of different specialized types that are a little bit, don't fall into that basic, simple or stratified of the three basic shapes. So that's where we get into pseudostratified. So pseudostratified columnar epithelium, this one looks multi-layered, but it's not. So it's fake stratified columnar epithelium. The main thing on this one, and we already talked about this a little bit, the cells are different heights. So everything is in contact with that basement membrane. Everything is not in contact with the apical surface. But because every cell is in contact with the basement membrane, it is a single layer of cells. So it is fake stratified epithelium, columnar epithelium. A lot of goblet cells usually, usually as cilia. Chances are if you see a ciliated epithelium, this is what I'm actually showing you. Uh, again, it's somewhat protective. The cilia helps move stuff past here. Probably the biggest area that I'll be showing this to you would be in the uh, the trachea is the main area where you have this. So anytime you aspirate something into your lungs that you want to be able to get rid of, the cilia is going to move it back up to the throat region where you can swallow it, trap it with the mucus from the goblet cells, and then use the cilia to move that back up. Uh, we do see a little bit of this in the male reproductive tract. I don't tend to show you that as much because it's not as easy to find. Uh, so again, mainly respiratory tract. And again, what is it doing here? It is secreting a lot of mucus. This traps dust and other stuff like that. The cilia then can sweep this out. Smoking damages the cilia, and that's why smoking can be deadly. Uh, so again, you can see the idea here. You can see lots of layers uh, of nuclei. Again, this one's kind of messy looking, tough to kind of see. So here's a good example of the trachea right here. You can see multiple layers of nuclei, goblet cells interspersed. All cells, again, can contact with the basement membrane, not all of them in contact with the apical surface, so it is a single layer of epithelium, but looks multi-layered, so pseudostratified. So again, mainly in the trachea, also in the epididymis. And really the last type here is this transitional epithelium. Kind of looks like a cross between stratified squamous and kind of a stratified cuboidal. Uh, got its name because of that. 
they call it transitional epithelium. They thought it was a transition type in between two different types. It's a misnomer. It is not. It is actually a uh, better name would have probably been, I always joke around and say a better name would have been stretchy epithelium. So this one is typically five to six layers. Looks a little bit more messy like this when it's relaxed, but when you stretch it out, it looks a little bit more regular like a stratified cuboidal. Uh, again, think about areas where you need something to stretch. So some type of organ that is one size, but over time might fill up and get bigger. If you're thinking the bladder, that was a good thing to be thinking. This is what we see lining the urinary tract. So lining the ureters, parts of the kidney, as well as the bladder is this transitional epithelium. It allows the integrity of that organ to be maintained, the lining, when it stretches out. Uh, when you flatten this out, it starts to look a little bit more regular. Some of the cells are binuclear, but generally single nuclei. Uh, again, lining that urinary tract, it allows the stretching to take place. Like I said, the name transitional came because they thought it was an intermediate between stratified squamous and stratified columnar. It wasn't, but the name stuck around. So again, I prefer if they would have called it stretchy epithelium. It makes it really easy, but it's a type of epithelium that can stretch and maintain the integrity of that gland. Again, find it in the kidneys, uh, the ureters, and the urinary bladder. Maybe small parts of the urethra, but not the full urethra. And again, you can see when it is relaxed, much messier looking. You can see it starts looking a little bit more regular when you see the distended or stretched out version of this. Uh, again, if they could have called it urothelium as well. That would have worked well as well because it is only in the urinary tract. But it's that specialized type that cells look a little bit more bubbly or domed, but then flatten out when the bladder is full. This allows distension of this bladder or stretching of the areas where we see this, and that's why it's important. And that's why we find it where we do. So really the last thing I want to talk about is just some of these different glands. All glands are made of epithelium, at least their main secretion portion. Uh, these are types of epithelium that are specialized to produce stuff here. We have exocrine as well as what we call endocrine glands. So exocrine glands are this substance producing epithelial cells that are to deliver whatever they're making, their secretions or their secretory products via a duct. Endocrine glands, on the other hand, have blood vessels close that these secretions diffuse into the blood for moving around. Endocrine glands, we will talk about specifically in a particular chapter with those. We'll talk about the pituitary gland, thyroid glands, and some of that. Exocrine glands, we're going to kind of be hitting at on and off throughout. Uh, some glands are unicellular, so a goblet cell is a unicellular exocrine gland. Uh, and that's making mucus, for example. Most of these are going to be multicellular glands. And I just wanted to show you this. Again, these are showing you a side view. You're never going to get a perfect slice like this, but these are all different types of gland shapes, which is part of the reason as we get into this further, and the only reason I point this out, I'm not worried about you. I'm not going to ask you to say, okay, differentiate a simple tubular from a compound acinar gland for me. But what I want you to show is, what I want you to see is that there is multiple types of epithelial glands. And a lot of times we'll talk about this being a particular gland. Some of these glands are going to look distinctly different from one another. So when you talk about a simple tubular gland, sometimes we talk about intestinal crypts, which have the fun name of the crypts of Lieberkuhn. Uh, those ones, they just look like a little trench. Sometimes we'll talk about other glands that you're going to see all these circular and elongated structures. That is because when you do a, 3D a 2D slice of a three-dimensional structure like this, it's gonna look distinctly different from something like this. So this is why I point these ones out here, that you can have a lot of ducts in different branching. So uh, tubular gland is just a simple end there, like a dead end road. Acinar or asini are gonna be more like a cul-de-sac where it's that little kind of end of the road there where it has that loop at the end of the road. And you can get glands that are combinations of these, compound branching, single branching, both tubular and acinar ends on some of these glands. These are all types of glands that are present. And again, just pointing it out so as we look at some of this stuff later on that you realize that these things may look different in two dimensions when we're calling it a gland because there is a lot of different distinct types of glands. 
And again, you can see some of the slides here, these multicellular exocrine glands. Uh, this is, looks to be the stomach right here with more of a simple crypts. But then you can see this is probably a little bit more, uh, might be pancreas right here. It's kind of hard to say with just looking at it right there. It's not a particularly good stain. But you can see a lot of stuff here with a main duct. And again, uh, sebaceous gland right here. This is one that's in the skin with a hair follicle right there. So you can see these are all glands. They look distinctly different from one another. Probably look all a mess to all of you right now because we haven't got into this very far yet. But by the end here, we're going to be able to differentiate some of this stuff. So just again, introducing the idea of these glands and how they can look very different depending on what's there. Another thing we see sometimes on here is there is these specialized cells. We see these in the mammary gland, for example, called the uh, myoepithelial cell. These are a contractile epithelial cell, kind of a cross between a muscle and a epithelial cell. Uh, see these a lot in the mammary glands. I did a lot of graduate work identifying these cells and seeing where they're at when ductal elongation is taking place in the mammary gland. Uh, that is, again, a specialized type of epithelial cell. Mainly wanted to let you know that they're there if you ever hear these explained. What I'm going to do now at the end of this one here is just kind of show you some of these on these digital slide boxes. Uh, these are going to be things I want you to go through to do your drawings that we'll talk about uh, with the class here. But you can see there's these three links right here. These are all going to be links to getting to some of these different pages. Uh, so if we click on a virtual slide box. It's going to go to some of these different websites here, which are going to allow us to look at some of this material. Uh, so if we're looking at these ones right here, you can see here's some epithelium in this one. You can see there's some different types of slide box right here. What's neat about these ones, these are digitized slides. So uh, if we're going to start with... Let's start with the simplest thing here, the simple squamous and simple cuboidal. So if I click on this one first here, we can zoom in on this. So again, these are digitized slides. They take a little while for the it to clear out, but you can see here. So what I'm looking for is a structure out on the surface here. All right, let's, there we go. So you can see these little circular structures right here. These are glomeruli lining the capsule of this is going to be some simple squamous epithelium. So if we zoom in just a bit more, if you were to look at one of these, you can see nucleus right there, nucleus right there. That is a simple squamous epithelium going around the outside of this. If we look at some of the other stuff on here, you can see cube-shaped cells right here. All these kidney tubules, and it's one of the best slides. I can find a bunch of them. Uh, all these kidney tubules here are going to be uh, simple cuboidal cells right here. So simple squamous lining this, showing you an example of it right here, simple cuboidal lining this one. If I was to then go back over and take a look at the jejunum, we can zoom in on the tips of one of these. But these structures lining all these villi, I'll zoom in a bit more here. You can see here, tall skinny cell, nucleus a little bit closer to the bottom. This is a simple cuboidal cell. It has microvilli on the, excuse me, simple columnar cell. It has uh, cilia, not cilia, microvilli on the surface. Some of these, if we look around a little bit more, you can see on this one right here, mucus producing cells. Those are goblet cells. So you can see a nice goblet cell right here, perfect view of one. Uh, that's actually releasing some of the mucus. So that is that goblet cell, something I would like you to be able to identify. So there's your three different types of simple epithelium. Uh, we can go to some of the specialized on there. If I go and take a look at the trachea here, we can zoom in on the surface of this. Take it over to the surface here. Zoom in a bit more. You can see on this one, multiple layers of nuclei right here, ciliated surface, there's another goblet cell. This is that pseudostratified, the basement membrane would be right there. This is that basement, uh, excuse me, 
that pseudostratified epithelium with the cilia will probably be the only thing I show you with cilia on this one, but that is pseudostratified. The other specialized one here is going to be in the ureter. So if we zoom in on the surface of this, again, you can see this is not distended, but this is that transitional epithelium. So lots of layers, kind of rounded cells at the surface. Uh, you can see a little bit cleaner looking over here. It's not quite as messy as that side, but you can see a little bit flatter at the surface, more bubble shaped as we get to here. This is transitional epithelium, uh, one of the stratified versions, uh, but again, one of those two specialized ones. Uh, the only other ones to kind of show you would be uh, stratified squamous. So if we go to this one right here, the esophagus, we can go to the surface of the esophagus here. And you can see it right here. Here's the basement membrane, flatten cells at the surface. They, as they migrate up, they get flatter. This is the non-keratinized version of stratified squamous. That's not really worried about you differentiating those as much right at the moment. Uh, if we had the skin, which is not in the list over here, you would have some flat, crusty stuff on the surface here of the keratinized version. But you can see beneath this basement membrane right here, that is connective tissue, but this is the epithelial tissue up at the surface here. And then, let's see here. I don't think we're gonna have it on this one, so I'm gonna back out here real quick. Go back to the menu. And if we go down to the female reproductive tract, I will show you the one other thing. So if we go and look at this ovary here, let's look at the other one. That's follicles, there we go. So if we look at this one here and we zoom in on this a little bit, this is probably one of the easiest spots to find stratified cuboidal. If we go down to where there's a follicle here, so here's a nice egg cell right there. You can see the cell surrounding it. If I were to zoom in on either of these, there is the egg cell right here. Here's the basement membrane. In between here is going to be stratified cuboidal. So those are all the different subtypes. So a lot of on this first test here, at least in terms of epithelium, is going to be about being able to differentiate these different subtypes. Uh, one of the things you're gonna be doing is going through and drawing examples of these and labeling them, uploading those pictures to our class website uh, for each person here. But this is kind of showing you where to find each of these in the actual digital slides. There is some on some of those other slide boxes as well. Some of them have slightly better slides than others, uh, depending on the subtypes here. But for epithelium, they're all pretty equally good in terms of being able to find these ones. So again, I want you going on these ones and actually looking at the actual slides. These are real slides that have been digitized. They're not gonna give you just the textbook picture that's always perfect. You can kind of see some of the confusion and some of the other stuff that you might see when it comes to actually being able to identify these in real life and that it's not always gonna be the perfect image or the perfectly formed slide of this stuff, but sometimes you need to be able to look at it and actually be able to identify it. So that's what we're looking at for the different epithelial subtypes. Uh, when we come back on the next one here, it is gonna be doing a little bit more of kind of your connective tissue proper, your basic types of connective tissue, loose and dense connective tissues, and then we'll finally do bone and cartilage and move on from there.